And we're live. Sorry for the technical difficulties, but I'm Jean Schumacher. I am the plant-based queen of diamonds, and my partner is Nancy Matthews. She is the plant-based queen of hearts, and together we are two peas in a pod living a plant-based lifestyle. Nancy is a plant-based lifestyle coach and can be found on Facebook on Plant-Based Chico, and you can connect with her through Facebook. And I have a new website called simplyplantbased.net and have a new program for plant-based beginnings. And this is to get your basic foundation and, and upon graduation, then you can go on to continuing education because the key is to continue educating yourself. So tonight we have Dr. David Deneyev back with us again. And he is a plant-based doctor who specializes in integrative medicine and an emphasis on high nutrient intake diet with fitness and stress management to prevent and reverse most of the chronic illnesses that we face. So you can find him through www.medicalcompassmd.com. So thank you, Dr. Denea, for being with us once again. Thank you, Dr. David. It's wonderful to be here. Awesome. We picked up um, where are we going to begin, Jean? We've got a great agenda. I don't know if you can recall our last conversation in December was about kidneys. So I know that we were thinking about picking right back up there, weren't we? We are. We're so, picking up. Well, I mean, let's start with the basics. I mean, let's start yeah, with why what, what is the function of the kidneys? Yeah. Okay. The function of the kidney is, of course, to filter out waste. What happens is we end up when we have a problem, we end up with chronic kidney disease. As far as chronic kidney disease goes, it's the silent killer. Why is it the silent killer, you may ask? I am. It's I'm asking. Silent, what is yeah, it? It's the, sil it's the silent killer because like high blood pressure, it has no symptoms until it's too late, until it's at the end stages where the end stages tend to show symptoms most of the time. Sometimes it has symptoms, but most of the time it doesn't have symptoms. And it tends to show symptoms when it's far progressed. And so when you're closer to the end stage renal disease. So there are three stages to chronic kidney, actually there are five stages to chronic kidney disease. And I think this is very important for us to focus on to begin with. The five stages of chronic kidney disease are stage one, stage two, stage three, but 3A and 3B, stage four and stage five. Stage five is considered end-stage renal disease or the time you have dialysis. Why is this important? Well, the first two stages, we don't even pay attention to. Almost everybody has either stage one or stage two, but stage three is divided into 3A and 3B. And it has to do with the glomular filtration rate, or what's called the GFR. And the GFR is how things move through the kidneys. And as that number comes down, your kidney function gets worse. So stage three is between 30 and 59. Stage 3A is between 45 and 59. Stage 3B is between 30 and 44. Okay, so you got those numbers. And then when it goes down from there, stage four, which is a much more serious situation, is from about 15 to 29, and then anything under 15 is considered stage five or potentially end-stage renal disease or dialysis. Now, do we feel symptoms? Most of the time, no. Do we notice anything? Most of the time, no. Do doctors even pay attention to stage one and two, no, we don't talk about those. But stage 3A and 3B, a lot of people don't even pay attention to those, which is a mistake because the disease progresses from stage 3A and 3B to stage four and stage five. I actually have a study here that says that stage three, chronic kidney disease, about 50% of it progresses to either stage four or stage five. So wow. that's huge because that means that people who are in stage 3A and 3B have a high likelihood of being in stage four and even higher likelihood, believe it or not, of being in stage five. This was a study done 
347 patients, and this was the Scandinavian Journal of Urology and Nephrology. So this is a good journal, and what it showed was that um, 34% went into, 35% basically, went into stage five kidney disease, which means it's dialysis level. It's when your kidneys may not produce urine or when they may produce a little bit of urine, but the toxicity is so high that you need to be plugged into dialysis. Then there's a second part of chronic kidney disease. The second part is called azotemia. Azotemia looks at blood urea nitrogen and then in ratio to the creatinine level. And creatinine usually clears very quickly. But if it doesn't, it rises. And if BUN or urea nitrogen, blood urea nitrogen rise, that's a bad sign too. If both of them rise, that really means azotemia and that the kidney is being affected. And what really affects it is especially dehydration with oh, wow. azotemia, with the BUN and the creatinine. And we'll go into more detail about that. But the number one cause of chronic kidney disease is diabetes. So I'm going to stop there. So I'll let you ask more questions and then we'll go into what I, I, I don't want to throw in a question, but would you like to hear about what blood factors are important? What blood tests are important to determining where you are in terms of stage? Right. Okay. Absolutely. Excellent. So why don't you Absolutely. ask me that so you don't feel like you're not asking a question. I'm just keep, go ahead. <laughs> Nancy, why don't you ask me that? <laughs> Dr. Danaic, would you be so kind yes. as to tell us what blood samples we need to tell us this information? Absolutely. I thought oh, you'd never ask. Oh, you are I such a I thought you'd doctor. never ask. <laughs> okay. Well, you know, I didn't want to take up the microphone too long. I wanted this to be interactive. So we've got to have some bad hey, humor here. It's and all it comes about from you. my side. It's all about right, you. Right, right. Come on, come on. No, it's not. No, it's not. It's about who we're talking to and how we can help them. Exactly. So, we talked about blood urea nitrogen and the creatinine levels, dehydration. We talked about the GFR, but, and that's very important because as the GFR goes down, we talked about the stages. But we also need to look at how much protein is in the urine. The more protein that's in the urine, the worse the kidneys are doing. And how we look at it is through two levels. One is microalbuminuria or albumin. Albumin is a lower level of protein, not quite full-blown protein or protein urea. And urea just means in the urine. So when I say albuminuria, I mean in the urine. And when I say microalbuminuria, I mean small amounts of albumin, which is a type of protein. But the kidney is never supposed to absorb protein and bring it through the kidney. It's supposed to reject it, so it's never supposed to be filtered through the kidney. So when you see microalbuminuria, it means the kidneys are getting worse. And the difference between 3A and 3B, besides the glomular filtration rate of the number, is the fact that microalbuminuria gets worse. And there can also be proteinuria, which means protein in the urine. So basically, it's either small amounts of protein in the urine or it's frank protein in the urine. And frank means larger, larger amounts. So those are very important factors when you're looking at chronic kidney disease to determine how bad it is and how it's doing. Well, I have a so, question. Go ahead. So is there a relationship? Because I know we don't store protein in our body. So if you're consuming too much protein, is that going to have an impact on your kidneys? That's my well, question. It depends. Well, that's a great question. It depends on the protein. So since this is a plant-based discussion, it's, Amazing, and it's coincidental, but not really coincidental, but that a plant-based diet helps with preventing the kidneys from declining in functioning. And the importance of that is that, before we go into detail on that, is that chronic kidney disease, I wanted to bring this up before we go into function of that. Why is chronic kidney disease so prevalent or why is it so important to talk about now? And I really wanted to just bring that up. From 2002 to 2016, the burden of chronic kidney disease in the United States grew faster than any other non-communicable diseases 
according to 2016 Global Burden of Disease Study. The loss of health and life increased substantially, particularly in younger adults between the ages of 20 to 54 years old. So that's really shocking. The findings suggest that an effort to target the reduction of chronic kidney disease through greater attention to metabolic and dietary risks, especially among young or adults, is necessary. So they're even emphasizing diet is a very important part of it. And then it goes on to say nearly 2 million healthy life years were lost in 2016 to chronic kidney disease, a 52.6% increase from 2002 to 2016, and a 58.3% increase in death from 2002 to 2016. And these are frightening statistics. Yes, so what are we attributing this to? Well, what we're attributing this to partially, partially it's diabetes because 50% of it, and, and instead of calling it, they call it, instead of calling it CKD, chronic kidney disease, they call it diabetes kidney disease, DKD, sometimes, because DKD is such a huge proponent. So what are they attributing it to? Well, I mean, it can be due to a whole host of factors. I mean, but a large portion can be diet, can be lifestyle, can be what you're doing when you're eating. And that's a big problem. And one of the problems is animal protein. Why is animal protein a problem? Animal protein is a problem for two reasons, two big reasons. One, it seems that animal protein puts a lot more pressure on the kidneys than plant protein. Why does it? And these are the two reasons. One is it seems that TMAO, which is trimethylamine, gets oxidized in your gut. And the only way you get TMA in your gut to begin with is by eating animal protein. Of course, you can be a vegan and not eat animal protein, and then all of a sudden, if you take L-carnitine, a supplement L-carnitine, or you take a supplement choline or betaine, these supplements, or if you take lecithin, all these supplements can all cause you to have the same reactions as someone who eats animal protein. So don't think just because you don't eat it, if you're taking those supplements, those can affect it negatively as well. But TMAO causes fibrosis or scarring on the kidneys. And that causes the kidney function to go down, which is a big issue. And a lot of people who have heart disease don't necessarily die of heart disease. They die of Kidney, kidney disease. disease. Mm-hmm. A oh, lot of times so, it's kidney failure. And then the second kidney. part, wait. Oh my God. Before That's it blows so your bad. mind, the second part is wow. that animal protein has phosphate. And now there's phosphate in plant protein, but animal protein's phosphate seems to have a toxic effect on the kidney. It seems to overpower the kidney. So that when you do have kidney disease, people are always watching your phosphorus level. But with animal protein, it seems that the phosphate from the animal protein seems to be far worse than from the plant protein. Both animal protein and plant protein have nitrogen or nitrogenous waste. So that's not a factor that plays a role, whether it's plant or animal protein. So we can rule that out. But the phosphate and the TMA, TMAO, when it gets oxidized, is what plays a huge role that separates plant from animal protein. And so there are studies that show adverse events with TMAO and the chronic kidney disease. Now, the interesting thing is when you have heart failure and you have chronic kidney disease, how do you treat it? Medically, it's very difficult because heart failure doesn't want you to have too much fluids or water, I should say, but fluids, I I would say fluids. And chronic kidney disease, you need lots of fluids to keep the kidneys going. So what gets the kidneys going? Fluids. What keeps the heart in heart failure from getting worse? Reduction of fluid. So what do you do? You got a quandary. What can you possibly do? And when it comes to medicine, we tend to give diuretics to remove fluid, but, and also for blood pressure. And we tend to say, well, diuretics have 
the most track record for blood pressure and for removing fluid. But at the same time, they kill the kidneys. I mean, because you don't want to dry out the kidneys. So what you can do is water, give water to people. Water is not a great hydrator. So how do you hydrate? Well, hydration, there was a study done uh, just recently that took about a liter of water given to 630 people split into two groups and one group getting a liter and the other group not. And they actually end up getting about three quarters of a liter. And what they found was the group that got three quarters of a liter extra of water every day on a daily basis had no difference in terms of statistically in terms of GFR getting worse or the chronic kidney disease getting worse. So it's not water. So then what could it possibly be? So giving water makes the heart failure worse and giving water doesn't make the kidney function better. So what does a person do? Overall. So what does a person do? Person person eats plants. Person eats plants because plants have a lot of nutrients. They have a lot of phytochemicals. They have, and they can also eat potentially soy because it has isoflavonoids. I mean, there are so many different things that you can look at to what you can do, but we're not made of water. And that's why water doesn't work. We're made of electrolytes and fluids so that that's why you want to look at a plant-based fruit vegetable type thing where you're increasing your nutrients and you're changing the osmotic pressure so it gets absorbed more readily and it doesn't have a negative effect on the heart failure. So not only can you help the kidneys, but you can solve the problem of having a problem with overflowing the heart. So you don't want to give water whether you have chronic kidney disease or whether you want have heart failure. You can drink water, but it's not going to do much to preserve your kidney function. And it's going to worsen your heart failure. So if you have a patient with heart failure and chronic kidney disease, give lots of fruits and vegetables. If they're consuming a liquid, wouldn't you want to say put some water with maybe some electrolytes like lemon juice, something like that, maybe some glucose? Wouldn't you want to drink something like that to help? problem is we don't know what happens when you just put honey in water or you give it lemon. There's no studies to suggest necessarily that it does anything. As far as we know, hydration is really good when you give half normal saline or normal saline in the hospital, which is 0.45% is half normal saline, 0.45% sodium. So if you're drinking something and it has 0.45% sodium, you're good. And then if it's normal saline, it's 0.9%. And you want to be somewhere between half normal and normal. So you don't want to have more than 1% of your fluid having saline in it, or you're going to shoot up salt. Too much salt, you don't want that to happen. Right. So should we be drinking then? What should we be drinking? Well, we can drink water. Water's fine, but it's not going to do a tremendous amount. What we should be drinking is, uh, you know, smoothies are a great way to hydrate the kidneys, make a big impact on what happens with the kidneys. So because now you've made the plants into emulsified foods, so now you can help the kidneys do much better. And that makes a big difference. But as far as giving water, you can drink water. There's nothing wrong with it. And not drinking water is not a good thing. I mean, you need some water. You definitely need some water. So I'm not saying don't drink water, but I'm saying that it's not a great hydrator. Right. It's not a great hydrator. I mean, we should be drinking water, but this is giving an indication that it's really not a great hydrator. Who knew? Which is right. Right. Who Who knew? knew? Who knew? They had to have a study to show it wasn't. Right. What's really funny about it is that there was a study done. The study showed that it's not a great hydrator. And then somebody, but he commented on one of the medical websites, and he said that with this trial called the Chronic Kidney Disease Water Intake Trial published in JAMA, which is a really well-known journal, I was pleasantly surprised by the results because a subset of indicator suggested that water may be better than not having more water may be better than not having water because an indicator well below GFR suggested that it might help 
potentially, but it really doesn't show that the GFR is stopping to go down, and the GFR is the most important factor when you're looking at the kidneys. So he's looking at it from, you know, there's a silver lining there. And why don't we know that? Because, oh, I don't know, because there haven't been studies showing that. And so this is really the first groundbreaking study suggesting that water is not a great hydrator, especially for ki the kidneys. Where was this done? When? Um, so when? Uh, when was this done? Um, it was done, well, it was published. That's what I can tell you. It was published in 2018. Have you heard of 2018? It was many moons ago. Yeah. So uh, the actual study, it doesn't say what the date. No, I just um, wanted to know how of, recent it was. So it sounds pretty recent. Uh, yeah, it's, it's groundbreaking. It's groundbreaking. It was published in August of 2018. Okay. So basically so we five, six months ago. Yeah, so, recently. And, right, right. And, and we really haven't looked at that. And, you know, the funny thing is we say, well, why don't we know this or why don't we do something about this? But, you know, we, we're giving medications that worsen the function of the kidneys. Yeah. We give medications all the time that worsen the function of the kidneys. The diuretics, water pills, are one of them. But right. there are many other. There's a diabetes med that removes fluids and, and salt and water basically salt and sugar called the SGLT2 co-transporters that everybody's bragging about how it helps with heart disease, but it, it, it can cause acute kidney failure. My mom took blood pressure medications from the time she was probably in her mid forties. And then mm -hmm. she had renal cancer. And one of the medications that she took her blood pressure medication was a diuretic. So are we putting something out there that Maybe there's a connection between, say, hypertension medications that have a diuretic in them and the potential for kidney disease down the road? Yeah, there's potential for kidney disease down the road by putting in diuretics, sure, because you're putting a lot of pressure on the kidneys. Not they're, renal they're cancer, working. but not right. kidney right. cancer right. necessarily. Right. Not the cancer part, but the chronic right. kidney disease, absolutely. You can put enough pressure on it, and you're making it far they're worse. Working. They're working all the time. That's that's right. um, that's ne that's mind blowing. I mean, yeah. I never never thought about that. Thank you, doctor, for explaining that to us. Shall we jump into some questions? I was just gonna. You must be reading my mind. Oh. Would you like me to, or would you it's like a, to? It's um, like with two peas in a pod. I love it. Okay. <laughs> well, I'll start. Okay. 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 Get over okay. yourselves and ask the question. Okay. Um, I'm excited. Hey, we're going we're gonna to say, hey, everybody, and thank you for joining us. Gene and I are back as two peas in a pod, and we just love oh our new God. name. <laughs> oh, my God. Maybe yeah. we'll be three peas in a pod with Dr. Why don't David. you blow each other a kiss, and we'll get it over with. So start asking questions. Okay. <laughs> so the question on deck, um, before I get into the question, I want to just say to everybody, please share in your timeline, because this could help somebody down yeah. the road. So you share this, share this in groups, share this on the timeline, please share this. So anyway, Mary Rogers asks, it's difficult for me to get away from salt when I go out to eat. So what can I do to compensate for the high amount of sodium that I get? Should I be increasing the amount of water to help flush out the kidney? So that's a great question. First of all, you should try to not have as much sodium. And I didn't even talk about sodium, which is brings up a very good point. I mean, it opens up a Pea pod, um, <laughs> two pods in a pea or whatever. You know, we can play off oh, this. Well, hey, we are talking um, about pea after all. Right, uh, we are talking about uh, pea. That was bad. Uh, that's, that's bad. That's, it's cute. <laughs> but anyway, so um, salt can play a significant role in worsening the function of the kidneys. So you want to try to avoid as much added salt as possible. What can you do to make up for it? Well, drinking more water is a good thing when you feel like you're dehydrated. However, drinking more water can also cause edema or swelling in the extremities, especially the legs. Mm. And so drinking more water can cause you to have more problems as well. It does not compensate for the sodium. It also can cause the blood pressure to go up more by drinking more water too. So what do you want to do instead? You want to eat to compensate. You want to eat foods that naturally 
have, does anyone want to take a guess? Potassium. Yes. Bingo. Give that girl a stalk of celery. Right. Um, you want to, that's school, right. You want to, you want to have high school chemistry. I mean, seriously. right. You want to, you want to have a ratio of uh, sodium to potassium. That's less than one. You want your potassium to go up. So if you're having, if you're having too much salt, you want to eat foods with potassium. And what foods have potassium? Nancy, Oranges. what foods have potassium? Name Oranges, one. Oranges. Um, and what? What? Almonds. I'm sorry, I didn't understand that pronunciation the first time. Now, Jean, name uh, another one if you can. Bananas. Bananas. Yeah. Raisins do. Dark leafy greens do. Especially um, Swiss chard. I mean, it's a wonderful potassium source. So you can get potassium from many different sources. Bananas being one of the lower levels of potassium, believe it or not, we always believe it's the highest. Mm -hmm. And it's not. Raisins have much more. Dark leafy greens do. Oranges do. Almonds do. I mean, there's a, I mean, so if you have a high salt meal, have an orange at the end, at least you'll somewhat compensate. But you want to try to say, please don't add salt to the meal, which means right. that if you're going out to eat and you're having soup, there is no way in the world you're going to get away from salt. And even if you say it doesn't taste salty, they put in spices to cover up the salt. So what I'd like you to do, if you want to know what salt tastes like, what salty soup tastes like or what regular soup tastes like, take about half a teaspoon of salt, put it in eight ounces of water and swish it in your mouth and then spit it. Don't swallow it, but spit it out. But swish it in your mouth for about 10 seconds and then do it again and again and again. And that's really what your soup is tasting like. Well, it's covered over with spices. I, yeah. Yep. And I went out to a restaurant and I'm one of the, you know, I'm very salt sensitive. I mean, extraordinarily. And I went to a restaurant and I made sure that the soup was vegan, that there was no oil added, la, 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 la. So I ate one cup, eight ounces, just eight ounces of it. And I had a salad with it. And I didn't even get out to the car. I, my head, I get blood pressure headaches and I thought my head was going to explode. And I went and Googled it and it was like 56% of the daily nutritional requirement in that eight ounces of soup that I just consumed. And I wouldn't consume that in a month. Never well, actually, mind. You just brought, you just brought up something very important. What do you think, what other disease do you think you should keep down what other malady do you think you should keep down to keep the fun kidneys functioning well? And that's high blood pressure or hypertension. When the blood pressure goes up, it negatively affects the kidneys. Yes. So you want to be able to protect the kidneys. How does that do that? It How puts a lot of pressure on the kidneys because it's putting pressure on the tubules. Okay. The afferent tubule. The afferent tubule goes through the kidneys, goes toward the kidneys. The efferin tubule is the one that then leaves it. So when you treat with an ACE inhibitor, an ARB, any of the any of the medications that treat the kidney, then what you do is you open up the efferin tubule. And opening up the efferin tubule is like opening up a relief valve on the boiler for hot water. So you want to open up that relief valve, and it opens it up. However, it doesn't necessarily reduce the risk of heart disease or cardiovascular wow. events. And the interesting thing was that there was just a study, actually a Cochrane review that's a meta-analysis. And the Cochrane review is very high-level meta-analysis, which takes a group of studies. And what they did was they took a group of studies and they found that when you can drop the level of blood pressure from the goal of 140 of systolic blood pressure, the top number, and drop it to 135, you think you'd do much better. But actually, compared to less than 160, <laughs> it's about the same when it comes to cardiovascular events like heart attacks and strokes. And in fact, in the last 10 years, cardiovascular events have gone up by 8.2%. So it's amazing that you rely on blood pressure medications to help you, but they're not really the answer. And the fact is that blood pressure medications do have an impact that help you in the short term, 
but in the long term, you may be in trouble. And the fact is that a lot of blood pressure medications have been recalled recently. Wow. So angiotensin receptor blockers, there have been lead in them. There's been related to cancer. Amlodipine, which is a calcium channel blocker, has been related to cancer. So there have been re recalls on these blood pressure medications as well. So you don't even know. And at a certain point, you say, okay, screw it. I just want to get the person's blood pressure down. It's way too high. I'm just going to put them on the medications, whether there's a recall or not, because this is the one that controls them. But they really need to do it by diet. So going to, I had a patient who was doing really well, and then they decided to go to the Chinese buffet. And all of a sudden, when they ate the Chinese buffet, both their blood pressure went up to like 190 to 200. I mean, at seriously high levels. And their kidney function, which was doing well, went back to trashing. And it went down. And that's a big factor. And also, I had a patient who was doing extremely well, whose kidney function was on the border of dialysis. Yeah. And within two months, we were able to get it up by like 45%. And the patient was doing extremely well and then went to actually, believe it or not, the hospital for a problem. And what they fed him caused his kidney function to go down worse than it originally was. Oh my gosh. And he was doing incredibly well. And how old was he when he was doing incredibly well? 91 years old. So it doesn't matter how old you are, you get the functioning up. And wow. so, and I've seen this in 88 year old, and I've seen this in age is not a factor to how you can get the kidney function up. Wow. But Crazy. We've got a question on deck. One from Carrie Britton. She wants to know, what do you recommend for end-stage kidney patients who have to limit potassium? What should they eat or is it too late? Well, end-stage, it's a tough call. End-stage patients, I haven't had, it depends on if you're on dialysis or not on dialysis. If you're on dialysis, you've got to really be careful with what you're doing with your potassium. And you've got to be very careful. And so you've got to limit foods with potassium to some degree. But it would be a shame to limit the dark leafy greens. So if I were going to do it, I would eat the dark leafy greens to get the potassium. I wouldn't eat the banana. I wouldn't eat the raisins. I wouldn't eat the orange because they don't give you enough benefit for the raising of the potassium. Now, raising of potassium for the most part, happens when people eat a plant-based diet anyway, and it doesn't have significant impact. So it may not have significant impact, but I'm not saying raise the potassium and don't worry about it. That's not what I'm saying. But I've noticed with my patients, I've had patients who have had high potassium levels and then sent them to the emergency rooms originally because they were way high, and the emergency room laughed it off because it was due to diet. And I was like, okay, due to diet is different from due to medications. But if you're on medications like angiotensin receptor blockers or ACE inhibitors or anything like that, so the RAS system, renin angiotensin aldosterone, if you're on any of those type of medications that affect the kidneys, those may raise your potassium levels. So now when you're eating and you raise the potassium levels in combination with the medication, that becomes dangerous, especially wow. dangerous. But diet alone, not necessarily. And I'm not recommending that if the levels go high, don't get it checked by your doctor and don't say something about it because you should. But what I'm saying is that with my patients, when the levels went higher just by diet, it had no impact. Wow. Interesting. That's we have another question. My, mind blowing. Yeah. Shall I read it? Please. P number one. All right. All right. Okay. Sydney Parker asks, once I began menopause, I began to get UTIs. Is all, mm -hmm. UTIs all the time. But now that I am postmenopausal, they have pretty much stopped. But at the same time, I began going plant-based through the process of menopause. I did go see a urologist who specializes in obstetrics and gynecology she recommended that almost her entire practice was made up of women like me starting menopause and utis any thoughts on why 
women get UTIs so prevalent while in menopause? Well, actually, I haven't heard a lot of people who have had a ton of UTIs when on menopause. However, it may be due to several reasons. It may be due to diet. I don't know. I'm not sure. But it may be due to the fact that you're having vasomotor symptoms. So if you're having hot flashes during menopause, you're sweating tremendously. And that is causing potentially a very wet area down in the vaginal region. And that may be causing potentially the UTI, the urinary tract infection. So when menopause is over and you're postmenopausal, and hopefully you've gotten past the hot flashes and the night sweats, or at least it's reduced significantly, then you can overcome UTIs. But if you want to overcome the hot flashes and the night sweats, one of the good things to do is beneficially is lose weight if you need to lose weight, because that makes a significant difference in helping to overcome night sweats and hot flashes. Yeah, that's true. That's, that's very, very true. All right. Well, that was, a, that was something that I wasn't too sure about the answer to the other. Well, the, the other thing is also, the other thing is the sympathetic nervous system, which is the nervous system that gets excited, seems to override the parasympathetic where you relax. So what you want are yoga and things that make you relax, meditation. And so it's also exercise as well. But exercise like running doesn't seem to cut down on the night sweats. But relaxation exercises may. And also foods that help you relax may also help reduce the vasomotor symptoms because you want to bring that sympathetic nervous system down. And what happens is the when you have a hot flash, you get that rapid heart rate and all of a sudden you feel that and it feels uncomfortable and then all of a sudden it breaks and you sweat and that is the breaking of the sympathetic so now the sympathetic cuts down and it's like it's going downhill and now you're going back to parasympathetic but in order to relax you sweat because it feels like you just ran a marathon yes. so i just want you to understand it's related to the sympathetic and parasympathetic okay nervous systems all well, right. one of the viewers, Jennifer Abernathy, she says, she has two comments. One, she says, I'm so confused because my doctor told me to drink a lot more water for hydration. And she also says, my mom has high blood pressure and the doctor told her to drink a lot more water as well. So what do you recommend to reduce high blood pressure? I've been reading <sighs> a lot of bad things about the medicines. Well, I recommend, you know, drinking water is good. Don't get me wrong. I'm not saying drinking water is a bad thing. By all means, drink water. We need water. I'm drinking water all the time. See water. But exactly, I, I recommend doing a plant-based diet. And I recommend doing, a lot of people say, like Caldwell Esselstyn, not to call him out on this, but he says, eat your nutrients rather than, or eat your plants rather than uh, drink your nutrients or plants or whatever. And I think that's interesting, but I think you're missing something there because when you emulsify it in a blender, you get more nutrients and not all smoothies are created equal. So you've got to be very careful with what's in the smoothie. So sugar and salt and fat, whatever, you know, plays a role. So I would say that changing to a plant-based diet, cutting out the animal protein can play a big role with high blood pressure, but getting the nutrient levels up, hence why I'm nutrient dense, makes a huge difference in terms of the endothelial functioning and in terms of nitric oxide. What makes blood pressure go down partially is the endothelium takes nitrates. Now we think nitrates, we think of preservatives for bacon and for locks and for, or as people would say, smoked salmon, if you don't know what locks are, but this is, I'm from New York and this is, I'm in Brooklyn. So locks is it, baby. That's what it says. If you go onto the Brooklyn bridge, it says locks, not these locks, meaning padlocks on the bridge, but these locks and shows a bagel with locks. So it's locks. I don't care what you say. There's no thing as smoked salmon. It's locks, baby. This is Brooklyn. 
Um, so anyway, so forget about it. Um, anyway, so the point of it is that nitrates from plants actually play a very positive role in giving the endothelium power to take nitrates and convert them into nitric oxide. And nitric oxide causes vasodilation, which means that your blood vessels are getting exercise. Yeah. And when you yeah. get exercise by running and doing things like that, it also causes your blood vessels to go like this because the pressure is going up and down and up and down. So this also helps as well. So you want to make sure your arteries aren't stiff. You want to make sure you're getting nitric oxide. You want to make sure you don't have atherosclerosis, which means plaques in your arteries. You want to make sure you're not overdoing it with fats. You know, all of that factored in. And you want to make sure you're not having a lot of sodium because uh, added sodium, that is, because ahead, plants sorry. have sodium, which is fine. But when you add sodium, it's not a positive thing. And then it causes too much flow of water or fluids, not water. Let me change that because it's not water, it's fluids. My mistake. And the fluids are like the subway because you guys aren't from New York, but I am, baby. So it's all about New York. Nothing else exists except San Francisco and New York and Chicago in the middle. Nothing else. That's it, baby. Yeah, just so you know, I'm in Brooklyn, and Brooklyn is the third largest city in the country. If you took away the rest of Manhattan, Manhattan, Queens, the Bronx, and everything else. So we are so large that you can't even say a word. I mean, we are the third largest city. So there you go. So I'm anyway, like a little Brooklyn bully here. I know, right? Are you? Are you? Because that's what it's all about. Hey. hey. Uh, the point of it is when you look at a subway system and you have a ton of people, you can't squeeze more into a subway car. It doesn't expand. It just gets so tight. And that's high blood pressure. And that comes from volume. And that comes from too much sodium. Right. Okay. Exactly. We've got another question from Misty Hayes Turner. She says, any recommendations for supplements for menopause for anxiety symptoms? She says wild yam. Uh, sure, sure. Black, you know, things like black cohosh are um, really a wonderful thing. You can try black cohosh. You can try valerian root. I try black cohosh first. And then I would try valerian root. And these make potentially a big difference. But like in com evening primrose. Yeah, evening primrose oil is fine too. EPO. And I like 1,200 milligrams from Doctors Best. I mean, that's the brand I like for that one. I don't, and just so you know, I don't sell supplements. I have nothing to do with supplements. So when I name a supplement, it's only because I like it. And right. so I have nothing to do with it. I have no financial connection to them at all. So if I named a name, it was because I, I find that one is easy to use and it's inexpensive. And that's what I'm saying. But I have no commercial interest whatsoever. I have something I'd like to, to offer Misty. When I was going through menopause and I was at the point of homicidal mania, <laughs> I called my doctor who'd been my doctor for over 30 years and I said, Dr. Brooks, you're gonna find me in jail if we don't come to some type of situation here. And he said, go to SNS Produce, this is the health food store, and get a, a supplement called Ester Logic. It's E-S-T-E-R, hyphen logic l-o-g-i-c very affordable it's 20 bucks a bottle i get i got it on amazon it has everything that you two just said it has black cohosh evening primrose it's got everything in there in the perfect dosage i took it for like three months and i was able to sleep it took care of those mood swings and it was, ab and it was, I'm a super, super Ooh. high risk breast cancer because my mom had breast cancer. So I wasn't worried about anything that had to do with any of that connection. I took it and it was a game changer and it, and it, I, I was able to keep my sanity through menopause and I was plant-based through menopause. And so I had about three months that it was pretty rough. So I really recommend Ester Logic. It's a supplement. Get it on Amazon. That's a well, that can be a really wonderful thing. So sometimes when you combine them, there are other factors that play a role. So when you combine them, they can play a really positive role. There's also a medication that can help with menopausal symptoms as well, but we don't have to go into that. It works on the central nervous system. So if you can't stand it, there is a medication that seems to calm it down and you can take a very low dose at night and it seems to work um, well. It's just, it makes you sleepy and you wanna 
go to bed after that. So there is a medication also. If all else fails, that can be used for that. And it's a um, blood pressure medication. That's an old, 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 old blood pressure medication, which is really cool. But I'm not talking about, you know, I'm not big into medications, but in that cir- circumstance, it can take away some of the problems. For truly temporary use. Right. Right, right. right. For truly temporary use. Absolutely. And the other right. thing is, the other thing is what's really interesting is that HRT, hormone replacement therapy, there was just a study that said that oral hormone replacement study has increased the risk clotting, we knew it increased the risk of clotting by 43%. However, bioidenticals and transdermal patch and creams don't seem to have that effect. Interesting. So if you did need something, it's a good sign because it doesn't seem to have the same clotting problems that orals did. And that's discussing it with your doctor. But or you know, creams are different and transdermal seem to be different than oral because oral goes through the first pass system of the liver and may have that effect by going through that system. But going directly into the bloodstream may be different. So it seems not to have that effect, and that's what this study showed. And that's right. just one study. But however, that's really, it's really interesting to know that there are options, and there are a bunch of options for menopause. And we can go into a menopause discussion and we of course should. I'm not a, I'm not a big medication person but topicals are not the same as oral that's good to know well and I, Misty I, Misty was saying that she had a hard time sleeping that she has a hard you know she can't sleep at all so a couple of things that I can suggest you know to help with the sleeping one was through Pure Haven Essentials they've got a blend of oil called Tranquility and I put that into the diffuser start that going it's going to help calm you the other thing to do is there is on uh, Do Yoga With Me, they have, it's free, I like free, they have a yoga, you know, for bedtime yoga, and it just really calms and just takes out the level of stress, so if you can help to reduce some of that, you know, without having to go the drug route. Well, and lavender oil is a great way to yeah. put well, it on your I feet do. and stuff like that, yeah. and I'm not saying the drug route, that's not what I'm pushing. And that, uh, understand that. Uh, but I'm, what I'm saying is there are different levels. And if you're stuck, you can go to different levels. But you need to talk to somebody who has the understanding that there are different levels and not just go to the drug level and say, well, screw it. I, I want to say something real quick to Misty, personal experience. Misty, I found that after about three weeks taking the Ester Logic, my sleeping improved because I had wicked bad insomnia a menopausal insomnia. I mean, lay awake all night. Bad, bad, bad. Thought that I had um, true Alzheimer's and was losing my mind during that three months. But I want to caution you on- Just this- during that three months? Oh <laughs> my, come on. So uh, I really want to caution you on using the Xanax because one thing that the pharmacists don't tell you and the majority of doctors that prescribe it is Xanax has a rebound effect. If you take it for longer than two weeks, it actually causes the symptoms for which you're taking it for. Xanax will rebound on you and cause you to have anxiety for which you're taking it for. And it's wicked hard to get off of Xanax. So be well, really, that's, that's not, really, really careful. I think that's a really great point. And I never brought up Xanax or anything like that because she has I hate it in those her medications. Comments. I know, she has it in yeah, her I, I, I absolutely hate time. those medications. And so yeah. when we were bringing up any type of medications, those were mild medication because I want her to understand that there are more options and I want other people to understand that there are more options but start at this level and if you need to go to this level this level is still okay compared to this level which is not okay and there are levels that are just not okay right and Misty the other thing is too is as Jean and I are sitting here telling you this both menopausal Dr. David cannot attest to this but I (laughs) promise you this too shall pass. You will survive it. Right now you're in the thick of it and us girls got to stick together through this, but, but do your best that you can. And the most biggest thing that you can do is to stop stressing about it. Really, really, really just let go of the anxiety that 
you're probably nervous, you're probably frightened and scared because our body is doing some serious business inside of us. So, you know, we're, we're doing stuff. Our hormones are all jacked up. So the biggest thing that you can do is just let it go and relax and accept the fact that, that our body is going through, quote unquote, the change and let it do its business. And, and then that really helped me just coming to terms with that it's natural, it's what I gotta do, let it go through its business, and then in a few months, it's gonna be over with, I promise you. It is not fun, but you'll get through it. <laughs> oh, I don't know, it was just so pleasurable. Yeah, those night sweats rock. <laughs> yeah, I love those things. Okay, uh, I, think, I have a question. Let's, let's do one more. Let's do one more. Okay. We got, we got a bunch more. We'll have to pick this up next time we talk because we got a I bunch know. more comments or questions. Oh my gosh. We are so great. Thank you everybody for your comments and joining us tonight. But this is a great question. Lori Baker asks, and she says, I am a nurse. I've just seen so many more young people suffering from kidney disease and doctors just say they don't know the cause. And the only hope is dialysis and transplant. I have a friend's son who is in his 20s, and I'm going to say this again, his 20s on dialysis. She wants to give him her kidney. I just want to give them hope that there is another option. But I've talked to her about dairy, and she says they drink milk every day, and they flat won't give it up. Is there a link between dairy and kidney disease? Well, there's. Uh, I don't know that you can use the term link because link would mean proving. But there's an association with animal protein in general, and dairy is an animal protein. It's a category that people forget is animal protein. So that puts a lot of pressure on the kidney. Um, stopping the dairy would be advisable. And if you're not willing to give it up, you can't force somebody to do it. And if you're not willing to give it up, then you know so be it. But know that you're putting a lot of pressure on the kidney. Getting a transplant is a wonderful thing, but if you don't change what you're doing, that transplant can turn eventually into a problem. And remember, you only have one kidney, and the person who gave you the kidney only has one kidney. So now their risk of having problems can go up as well because now you've cut the nephrons or the substances that work in the kidney to help clear it out, you cut it in half. So when, while it's a great and altruistic thing to give a kidney, you now have to be extra careful. Yeah, definitely. Well, I just want to stick in, you know, there's the, Walter Kempner had tremendous success at Duke University in reversing people that were severely with chronic kidney disease and had tremendous success with, and it was kind of a very restrictive diet within the plant-based world, but he had tremendous, not only reducing high blood pressure, but reversing kidney disease as well. It was rice and, what so was base, it, rice and fruit? Yeah, rice and fruit, basically. And fruit. Yeah. You know, I mean, there were some other things, and there's a bunch of recipes, but right. that's basically what, right. you know, the rice, basically just giving a good carbohydrate, you know, along with some fruits and vegetables kind of thing. But it was very limited and very restrictive, and, but he had tremendous success. I mean, weight loss, high blood pressure, and, and kidney disease. Well, right? I've seen in my patients, like I said, I've seen in my patients, I've seen people go from stage three to basically having a kidney of a 30 year old from, you know, I mean a healthy 30 year old, not the 20 year, 20 something year old that had uh, dialysis. But this is the point I was making originally. And then we kind of have to stop, but this was the point I was making originally is that chronic kidney disease is growing as a disease, as a chronic disease. And it's growing, especially in the ages between 20 and 54. So 20 something, would fit that 20 to 54. And the dialysis is growing as well. And the scary part of dialysis is that when we urinate, or when we pee, two peas in a pod, but when we pee pod, um, uh, we get, we. how many times do you pee in a day? Do you think about it? It's probably like five or six, and how many times at night? Maybe one or two, maybe, whatever. So let's say, let's round it off. Let's say about 10 times a day that you may pee. I mean, and that's a 24-hour period. In dialysis, you're going to dialysis maybe three or four times a week. Ooh. That's not natural. And dialysis, I'm going to leave you on a very morbid point. Dialysis, when you go on dialysis, if you're stuck on dialysis, it's a death sentence between two and five years. 
and you are almost guaranteed to die either in two years or by five years. That's not, so I did that, not know that is a very, not everybody, but that is a very high likelihood. Wow. I did not know that. That's scary. That's really sad. We do sad. not want to get to that point. That's right. Sad. We it's want really, it either. Right. It's, it right. breaks my heart because this is, this is a huge swath, a huge demographic of our 20 to 54 year olds. Huge, right. millions of people. Right. And then right. I still see people. They're still pushing paleo. They're still pushing the freaking keto diet. And we're overtaxing our kidneys with animal protein. And it's just going to get worse. It's right. Perfect. We need to make many changes. And we it do. comes from the dietary. It doesn't come from the medication. Don't look to the medication yeah. to solve the problem. There is not one medication, really, that can elevate the GFR to get the kidney function to go up. There is wow. not one real medication to do that. There are many wow. medications to make it go down. So don't depend on uh, conventional to bring the conventional medicine to bring that up. Wow. And don't ignore when you have chronic kidney disease in stage 3A because 3A can progress to 3B and can progress, like we said, 50% can progress to four, stage 4 and stage 5. And wow. so wow. don't ignore it. And if someone says, well, your kidney function went down, and I've heard this one before. My doctor tells me it's just because of age, and I'm older. That doesn't mean you should have that. And there is no such thing as just, I mean, age plays a role, but we can improve things dramatically, and we can right. make life much better. Well, it's not normal. It's not normal to lose the function no. of your kidneys as you age. It's no, it's, 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 it's not normal. And there's nothing well, normal about us, well, any of us. Thank the you. three of us. Nothing Thank normal. You. All right, well, so we have to cut off. Thank you, well, Dr. I just want to. I just want to point out, if anybody's ready to begin a plant-based lifestyle, they're not quite sure how to start, I'm starting Plant-Based Beginnings February 1st to help. Get, it's kind of like a boot camp. It's kind of giving you the basics and the foundations of a plant-based lifestyle. So if you're ready, join us on simplyplantbased.net. You can join that program right there. Join us. Love to have you. We're, it's going gonna, it's gonna to be awesome. The support is amazing. Recipes, coaching, it's just, it's all there. It, it, it's going to give you the tools to be successful. So Dr. Deneev, thank you so much. Nancy, personal coaching, she is amazing. She gets, I, I don't call her the queen of hearts for nothing because she is just phenomenal. Absolutely <laughs> phenomenal. And she gets right to the, to the, right to your center. I mean, she's very empathetic. So and Dr. Deneev, wow. I mean, you've been healing people all over the place. I mean. All over Brooklyn, the biggest. I know. Third, the third biggest city in the world. How'd you know that? <laughs> Just a wild guess. That's amazing. <laughs> well, thank you very much. And thank everybody. Please do share on your timeline because somebody might hear this. We're going to continue on this conversation because we no. still have a bunch more questions to ask. Yeah. You have so, to you have to share, folks, because how many people are on blood pressure medication? And we just learned that this is... Well, we can talk we, about high blood pressure, too. Yes, we, we will. Do. We talked about it in, in terms of heart disease, but yes. I think the two... Well, we can talk it. about it on its own. Yeah, we, we talk about it on its we own. Should. All okay. right, everybody. We'll see you next time on Two Peas in a Pod. Thanks for joining, and please share, because we want to make sure somebody else gets the opportunity to hear this great information as well. Good night. Good night. Good night, Mary Ellen. Good night, John Boy. Good night, Dr. D. <laughs> Good night.